Well, as I've already mentioned, our text this morning is Hebrews chapter 11. And perhaps we can use what we read in this chapter as preparation to come to the Lord's table. Because the Lord tells us we do need to have faith as we come to the table, and we need to have the particular kind of faith that the author to the Hebrews is going to show us this morning, a faith that sees the invisible, a faith that believes those things to be true, a faith that welcomes those things and embraces them, and who lives according to the things that we actually see by faith. Uh, that's what we're going to look at now as I read Hebrews 11. And again, as we go through the book of Hebrews in this fashion, we are biting off huge chunks of the book at one time. But we do need to see that he does give us many examples simply to illustrate the point that faith will make a difference in the way we live. And the difference it makes is we will turn our backs on the world and we will pursue the kingdom of heaven. That's what saving faith does. Let me read this for you now then in Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, I should just back up one verse. He's, he, after he gives the warning, he says this, We are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, for by it the men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. And he was not found because God took him up, for he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance and he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise as in a foreign land dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah herself received the ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, there was born even of one man, and him as good as dead at that, as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number, and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son, it was he to whom it was said, in Isaac your descendants shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau, even regarding things to come. By faith Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the exodus of the sons of Israel and gave orders concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, when he was born, 
was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Considering the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is unseen. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood, so that he who destroyed the firstborn would not touch them. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as though they were passing through dry land, and the Egyptians, when they attempted it, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she had welcomed the spies in peace. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection, and others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with a sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men of whom the world was not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. And all these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive what was promised because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. Really, everything's been said that already needs to be said. We're just going to kind of go over this ground again in the hopes that the Lord perhaps will show us what it is we ought to be aiming our lives at. And by the way, let me just mention uh, regarding that last statement that he made is that all of these were able to believe God. They had faith to believe His promises. They could see what He had said. They trusted that He was faithful and that they would receive it. And yet, none of them actually received what God had promised as far as uh, the reality of those things. They never saw Jesus Christ come. They never saw the, uh, the new heavens and the new earth. Actually, His readers did. And uh, He points out that uh, God had provided something better for us, and that is, of course, the fulfillment of His promises in the Lord Jesus Christ. But he, he goes back to show them the importance of living the life of faith, of believing God's promises and realizing that we have something uh, more precious. We actually have what was promised to them, that they believed they were going to receive, and finally, uh, well, we finally received it, and they, of course, received it when Jesus came. They received the benefits of it before that time, we understand, but they were looking forward to it. These see it. We're looking back to it. It is the Lord Jesus Christ and all that comes through Him. But again, we need faith to see it. We need faith to desire it and embrace it. We need faith to go that direction. And that's what the author reminds us of this morning. Now, again, the author has been showing us, of course, that Jesus is superior in every way to the Old Covenant system, and every way in which He is superior uh, to that system, though it meant something to the Jews, also means something to us, because Jesus is better, and He is the best. And he showed us last time that rather than ministering in a tabernacle that was on the earth, Jesus actually appears in heaven for us. And He appears as our priest, and He appears with better blood than the, the blood of bulls and goats, which only foreshadowed His sacrifice. He appears with His own infinitely precious blood. And on this basis, 
we are accepted by God if we trust Him. On this basis, the author to the Hebrews is urging us, he's encouraging us to press forward. And again, I would remind you, these aren't just pious words, but these are things that we are to be doing. The Lord wants us to press forward towards heaven. We are to be, as uh, it's put in various ways in Scripture, but we are to be, as Jesus said, like violent men trying to take a city. We need to do violence to ourselves, to our own sins. We need to pursue the kingdom of heaven with that kind of zeal. And he's going to show us that that's exactly what these men have done. Now, the author to the Hebrews reminded us again that Jesus, through his ministry, through his sacrifice, has opened the door to heaven. And so he says you are to draw near to God through faith in him, that you are to hold on to him, that is, by trusting him and by doing his will. And he says that you are not to neglect the gathering of God's people together for the very purpose of encouraging one another to pursue these things, to love and good deeds. The Bible reminds us that there's really only one of two directions that we can be going at any one time spiritually. We're either moving forward or we're moving backward. There really aren't any other options. Now, if you're not going forward, then you are going backwards. But the author to the Hebrews says if you want to see heaven, you have to to be moving forward. You have to be pursuing those things. He's going to tell us in chapter 12, we need to be like those running a race and running in such a way that we may win. He says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 that we need to be like those fighting a fight, not like a boxer, not just beating the air, but landing those punches where they need to be landed. We need to be pressing forward. Now, again, the author reminded us that, we, that if we turn away from Christ, if we, if we go back into the world, that we're basically siding with the Jews. We're really no better than they were. They rejected Jesus Christ. They rejected His sacrifice. They counted His shed blood as something unclean. The author to the Hebrews reminds us that if we turn away from Christ, we're going to have to answer to God for our sins because this is the only sacrifice that can actually cleanse us. But he also reminds them again and again, and reminds us as well, that the very worst sin that we can commit is actually turning away from what we know of the gospel, from what we know of Jesus Christ, and going back into the world. In other words, apostasy, which he's already reminded us in Hebrews chapter 6, is a sin that we may never recover from, the unpardonable sin when we've experienced so much of God's knowledge and His blessings and yet we still turn away from Him and we go into the world. When Jesus sent His disciples out to the cities of Israel, the towns and villages to preach the gospel, He told them what it would be like for those who wouldn't even listen to the gospel, even just that one exposure to it. He says, whoever does not receive you nor heed your words as you go out of that house or that city, shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. It is a great sin to turn away from the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is why we need to keep pressing forward. The author to the Hebrews is encouraging them, don't turn away from the reality to go back to the shadows. He's encouraging us, don't turn away from Christ in order to go back to the world. Does it make a difference? It makes a huge difference, the difference between heaven and hell. You need to press forward. But to do that, the author shows us this morning that you, there, there's something in particular that you need, and that is faith. Faith to see what cannot be seen. Faith to understand that what God says in His Word He really means, he's really serious about that these things are real, they are true. Faith to believe God's promises in order to escape this judgment, faith to embrace them, the kind of faith that actually saves. Now, the author goes on to tell us more about this faith and what it does in the lives of those who are blessed enough by God actually 
to possess it. And he tells us three things, at least three things. I'm sure there's more than that. But what faith is, what the benefits are of faith, and what kind of a difference faith will make in your life if you actually possess it. And that, of course, is, takes up the bulk of the book through these numerous examples. So first of all, he explains what faith is in verse 1. And this is where you should turn when you want to explain it to others. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. A simple definition of faith. Faith takes God at His word. God promises to do something, and you believe Him. You know it's true. Even though you haven't seen it happen yet, even though you don't see it now, you're fully convinced that it's going to happen. And so you live expecting that it will happen. In other words, you base your life on it. But I want you to notice the author says there is more than this. It's not just that you're convinced that what God has said is actually going to take place, but it's seeing that and welcoming it. It's actually looking forward to it. In other words, you see that what God has promised is something desirable, something that is good, something you want to happen, and you look forward to it. You look forward to the fulfillment of God's promises with, you might say, a hopeful expectation. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Faith is not the assurance of things that I'm indifferent towards. Faith is not the assurance of things that I care nothing about or that I even hate. Faith is the assurance of things that I hope for because I want them. Now, you can begin here to examine the kind of faith that you have. Do you believe that God is going to do what He actually says He's going to do? And do you look forward to the fulfillment of those promises? I don't know how many times I've caught myself thinking, you know, I believe that heaven exists, but for some reason, I don't want to go there. I want to hang on to the earth. I don't want to die. I'm, you know, maybe you've experienced that same thing. But if we really believe that what God promises is good, then it's something we'll long for even as the Apostle Paul, who would rather die and be with Christ than continue on in this world. You see, that's what faith does. It sees what God promises. It knows it's true, and it hopes for those things and desires those things. It welcomes them and embraces them. It makes a difference in the way that we live. Well, that's what faith is. Secondly, let's consider what the benefits of faith are. I think we've already seen a number of them. But the first and most important benefit is that this kind of faith is the kind of faith that saves. This, it, we're talking about the kind of faith that is different than the faith of devils uh, who believe what God says as well and know it's true and even tremble. But this kind of faith actually desires, as I've said, desires what God has promised. Now, when this kind of faith, first of all, eyes the promises of God in the gospel of God, the promise of eternal life, the promise of the forgiveness of sins, when it sees Jesus offered to us a Savior, it embraces Him, it welcomes Him, it trusts Him, and it follows Him. Uh, this is how this kind of faith responds to the gospel. It receives Jesus Christ as Savior and submits to Him at the same time as Lord because that is what you want to do. That is what's in your heart. That is what, uh, well, God meant in Jeremiah 31 and as we've seen in Hebrews chapter 8, by the blessings of the new covenant, putting His laws in our minds and writing them on our hearts. He gives us the desire to surrender to Jesus Christ. Is that the kind of faith that you have? Do you believe Jesus Christ is Savior and have you embraced Him from the heart and have you submitted it to Him? Do you love the things He actually calls you to do? And are you seeking to put Him on? Are you seeking not to put Him on in the sense that I'm trying to deceive Him? I mean, some of us may be doing that and we need to stop because the Lord knows what's in our hearts. But are you putting on the Lord Jesus Christ as He calls you to, loving Him and seeking to become like Him? That's what saving faith will do. 
So if you don't, if you haven't, if that's not what's in your heart, if you only have the faith of devils just believing these things are true and thinking somehow that's going to get you to heaven, if you don't really want Him as Savior, then you still need to repent and believe because that kind of faith won't save you. Only the kind of faith the author to the Hebrews is talking about that sees and embraces. It's not enough to see. You must also embrace. And only God by His Holy Spirit can do that. You need to pray that He would give you that grace. So the first benefit of this kind of faith is it embraces Jesus Christ as He is offered in the gospel and follows Him. Now, the second benefit is that this faith gives you the means by which you might actually please God because this kind of faith is the only thing that does please Him. And if you love Him, then pleasing Him should be at the very top of your list of priorities. You cannot please Him without faith because if you don't have faith, you can't even really believe that He is. Now, we do understand in the book of Romans that Paul says everybody knows that God exists, but what the author to the Hebrews is talking about here is that clear and firm conviction that the God who is revealed in Scripture exists, the triune God. That's something we can't know from nature. We do know that a lot of things about God, but faith knows that the God of the Bible exists and pursues Him. Now, certainly, if you don't believe that He exists, you won't pursue Him. You won't seek Him for the rewards that only He can give. And you see, if you don't have a faith that works by love, you won't even care if He does offer rewards because you don't want them. So the second benefit of this kind of faith is that it enables you not only to believe in the biblical God, but to pursue Him, to seek Him for these rewards because He is a rewarder of those, but only those who seek Him. Now, on the other hand, of course, if you do have this faith, if you do have this grace, if you do know that He exists and you seek after Him, you will seek Him. And you will seek Him no matter what it's going to cost you. And you will receive what was promised. This is the faith that pleases God. God. Now, again, faith means that we not only believe that what God said is true, but we are willing to bank our lives on it. We are willing to spend our time and our lives in this world living in such a way that demonstrates that we actually do believe these things. We will seek God, and we will turn away from this world. And that's exactly what we see in uh, these examples that the author to the Hebrews now gives us. This is really what the rest of the chapter is all about. Many examples of the difference that faith makes in our lives, how it works itself out. And this is the way it should work itself out in your life if you have this kind of faith. Now, one thing I should note is it's interesting that all the examples that he gives us in this chapter are from the Old Testament, which is interesting because undoubtedly there were more recent examples he could have given The author to the Hebrews writes toward the end of of the ministry of the apostles. He could have pointed to any one of them, but he didn't. He pointed to the Old Testament saints to show his readers who are Jewish believers being tempted to go back into the Old Testament ceremonial system that even those before that system, even those in that system, every one of the heroes of the faith that the Jews would embrace, every single one of them lived by faith and received God's approval by faith so that they would pursue the same things that they did. Now again, what will faith look like if it is in your life? Well, first of all, it's going to help you answer those questions that are the most important questions that we ask when we come into this world. When you get old enough to really understand things about the world, who am I? Where did I come from? Where am I going? Why am I here? Well, faith answers all these questions. It tells you where you came from. God made you. Verse 3, by faith we understand the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are not seen. God is the one who made you. That's where you came from. Where are you going? 
Well, if you're a believer, you're going to the city, he says, which has foundations, not the city of this world, which is, you might say, has a temporary foundation. Uh, one day those foundations are going to crumble and the whole creation is going to be destroyed. You are looking for a city that has lasting foundations, whose architect and builder is God. So you came from God, He created you. You know where you're going. You're going to heaven if you're trusting the Lord. And by the way, that's something that those outside of Christ know nothing about. They believe they're just some kind of a cosmic accident, that we just came about by some eternally existing matter, random collisions, some great accident. If you have enough time, anything can happen. We've happened. All these things weren't designed. They, they're just a cosmic accident. And so why are we here? It's an accident. Where are we going? Into nothingness. Why are we here? No reason. We just exist. Is it any wonder so many people in this world commit suicide? Because if there's no reason for living, if there's no reason for any of this, then what's the purpose of anything? What's the purpose of even living? You see, God gives us purpose. That's what faith does. And we need to be thankful that He does that because it preserves us from self-destruction. But of course, knowing where we came from and where we're going, we also know why we're here. And that is to glorify God. It's not to make our home in this world. It's not to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin in this world, but it's rather to deny ourselves, pick up our crosses, and follow after the Lord Jesus Christ. Thankfully, God has revealed that to us as well, and faith gives substance to that so that we desire it. So again, let's consider how faith made this difference and, and how it had this effect in the lives of all those the author speaks of in this chapter. And by the way, these are not just characters in a book. These people really existed. They were just like you and me. They had the same desires that we had coming into the world, perhaps the same opportunities we have, some of them greater opportunities, some of them less, but they all chose the same thing. They chose to trust God. They chose by His grace to put value on what it is He promised, and they lived in the light of those promises. For instance, it was faith that compelled Abel to give to God the kind of sacrifice he desired, and that was a blood sacrifice. And he gave it out of love to him, even though he knew it would make his brother hate him, though he may not have known it was going to cause his death, he was willing to do what God called him to do because he loved him. It was faith that made Enoch turn his back on the world. There were other people alive during that time, but Enoch made a specific choice. He was going to walk with God, and he walked with God so closely. His life was so pleasing to God that God actually took him directly to heaven before his life had run its course. He didn't even have to see death because he trusted God and walked with Him. It doesn't mean that God came down and He walked side by side. What it means is... He loved the Lord, he obeyed the Lord, the Lord was his life and his direction, and God was pleased by that. God is pleased by that kind of faith. Faith is the reason why Noah spent a hundred years of his life, a fifth, a hundred years is more than, than all of us pretty much are going to live, only, you know, it was well, actually more than a fifth of his life, wasn't it? It was more like a tenth of his life, or I should say less, it was a tenth of his life, but a hundred years, a hundred years, building an ark to save his life and the lives of his family and of the animals simply because God told him he was going to bring a flood. Noah didn't see the flood, and yet, I mean, he saw it when it came, but he didn't see it before he started to build the ark. But he believed God, that God was going to do that, and he acted on it. He believed, he took God's word for it. That's what faith does. It was because of faith that Abraham left his home and left his relatives to go and live in a foreign land. When he arrived there, God told him, he goes, look up now, to look to the east and to the west, to the north and the south, all this land I am going to give to you and your descendants. And you know what? Abraham in his lifetime, the only portion of the land that he actually possessed was the plot of land that he had bought in order to bury his wife. He didn't actually own that land while he was alive, but he believed that God, when he said he was going to give it to him and his descendants, would give him 
that land. Sarah was able to conceive when she was 90 years old. Maybe it was 89 years old. She gave birth at 90 because she believed that God was able to do that. By the way, I want to just make a note here that Noah, Abraham, Sarah didn't just choose what they wanted to believe and then believed it and expected God to give it to them. That's not how faith works. That's the way that, you know, the faith gurus, the faith peddlers will tell you that faith works, but that's not the way it works. Faith looks to what God promises and believes it because God said it. We don't just simply choose what we want to believe and then God's got to give it to me because I asked for it, okay? So they latched on to God's promises and they believed it and they desired it and they hoped for it and they knew that they had it even though they never actually saw it in this life. Abraham believed God when God told him to look at the stars of the heaven. I'm going to give you as many children as are there or the sand that is by the sea. Abraham believed God and it happened just as God said. Not because Abraham believed it, but because God said it. But Abraham's life was changed because he trusted God and that's what he wants us to do is trust him. Again, Abraham didn't live long enough to see that God's fulfillment of the promise of the land of Canaan. He didn't live long enough to see, you know, the, the number of children, as many as the stars of the heaven and the sand by the sea. He didn't live long enough to see the new heavens and the new earth. It still hasn't come from our perspective. He didn't live long enough to see the coming of that special child that God had promised to him through your seed. And Paul says seed meaning one, Christ. Through your seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. He didn't live to see any of that. And yet, he saw them. He saw them because God promised. He saw them because he had faith. He believed. He even embraced it. And we know from Scripture that he was saved. Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, the righteousness of faith that comes from trusting in Jesus Christ. Now, all of these, the author says, believed God, and because they believed Him, they pleased Him, and God was not ashamed to be called their God. God has prepared a city for all who will believe Him, for all who will trust Him, for all who will love Him and embrace His Son as He offers His Son to them in the gospel so that they can live with Him. I mean, Enoch walked with God and God took him because he was pleasing to Him. God's going to take every one of us who trust Him and who walk with Him to heaven. The author goes on to say that Abraham was even willing to offer up his son Isaac when God commanded him to offer him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that He would show him. And Abraham knew that Isaac was the one through whom God was going to fulfill the promise to bring all these children. Well, how can I kill him? If I kill him, then the promise will die with him. Well, Abraham didn't believe that. Abraham believed what God said, that he was going to bless him through Isaac. Through Isaac, his seed would be named. So he knew that if he should kill Isaac and even burn him into ashes, that God would still be able to to raise him up, and God would raise him up because Isaac had not yet had any children. That's how much Abraham trusted God. He had a very strong faith, I think we'd have to uh, admit. The author to the Hebrews goes on to say the fact that God spared Isaac on the third day after he had commanded Abraham to offer him up. It took three days to get where they were going to go for the offering. That that was a picture or a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, Isaac was dead in Abraham's mind for the three days from the time he commanded him to be sacrificed to the time when he spared his life. He was dead to him for three days. But when God spared him, he received him back. He was raised again, as it were, to life. And that was a picture of how God would give his only begotten son, the one through whom all the promises were made, Jesus. And how on the third day after he had died, he would raise him up again. So Abraham, in doing this, the Lord was basically providing a picture of Jesus Christ. And Abraham somehow knew that. Jesus said of Abraham, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it. And he was glad. How did Abraham see 
that. He lived hundreds of years before Jesus even came into the world. He saw it through these pictures, through these types, and through these promises that God had made to him. He saw it through faith. He welcomed it. He embraced that one, and he was saved. Isaac, before he died, blessed Jacob and Esau with regard to the things that were coming based upon what God promised because he believed God. Jacob blessed Joseph's two sons for the same reason, and Joseph, before he died, commanded the sons of Israel, when you leave Egypt, and you're going to leave because God promised that you would, take my bones with you and bury them in the promised land. He did that because he believed God. Now, I want you to note the example of Moses. Moses was willing to give up for his faith, something that most of the people of this world are seeking after. Moses gave up notoriety, or I should say not notoriety, it could be a negative connotation. He gave up fame and fortune. I mean, Egypt was the most wealthy nation of the world in those days, and he could have had all of it. But he gave it up in order to identify with slaves and to suffer with them, particularly the reproach of being their leader because he believed God and he believed that what God promised was better. It was going to be something he would enjoy more and something he would enjoy longer. And so he sided with them. Because he had faith, he had the courage to stand before Pharaoh and say, let my people go. He had the faith to keep the Passover, and so he was spared, and the firstborn of Israel were spared because they believed God. He had faith to pass through the Red Sea on dry land, even though when the Egyptians tried it, they were drowned. Joshua and the armies of Israel, when they were given the task of taking Jericho, and Jericho had walls that reached up to heaven that seemingly were impregnable. He believed God when God said, march around it on seven days and I will cause it to fall flat. They marched around it for seven days and it fell flat because they believed God was going to do what he said. Rahab and her household were spared because she believed when God said he was giving the land to Israel that he was going to do that. She believed it. She acted on it. She hid the spies. She was spared and became a part of the people of God. These great leaders of Israel, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, and David, were able to defeat their enemies. Daniel survived an entire night among hungry lions. Remember, the next day, the king threw in all of his accusers and their families, and the lions immediately devoured them. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego survived the fiery furnace, which was heated seven times hotter than normal, that killed the people that put them in because they believed God. God because they had faith. There were many who trusted the Lord who, you know, didn't experience these great victories but who were still willing to do it even though it meant they had to suffer for it. They were willing to undergo whatever they had to in order to reach that city that God had promised, to be ridiculed, to be tortured, imprisoned, sawn in half, stoned to death, to live in deserts, in mountains and caves and holes in the ground. Sounds like some of the hermits that lived in church history. But they were willing to do this, these, for a righteous reason, because of persecution, rather than live in comfortable homes, because they weren't willing to compromise. They would do what God called them to do. They would know it was right. They would know it was good. They welcomed it because they wanted it, because God said it. They believed God was going to provide for them something that was better if they were only willing to give up what was in this world. Now, all of these did what they did because they believed God. And the author, I believe, implies that through faith they were also able to see Jesus Christ and they, were, and, and welcomed, they welcomed Him, they trusted Him, they were saved by Him, but they were even willing to lay down their lives for Him so that they could enter into His kingdom. They believed God. They trusted God. They they banked their lives on it, as it were. They didn't just hear it and forget it as they went about their daily life. It controlled what they did. And let me just remind you that these really only had the types and shadows. These only had the promises, but that was enough. 
we have much more than they have, don't we? We have seen the fulfillment of these promises in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have eyewitness testimony to the fact that Jesus came and that He fulfilled all the promises that God had made regarding the Messiah. And we've seen how faith in His name affected not only those who lived before He came, but also those who have lived after. As a matter of fact, uh, we even have, as, as uh, the Duzels recently saw, we have the testimony of many more people who have lived since the closing of the canon, who bank their lives on the truth of what God says because they had faith and because they desired what it is that God told them. Now, again, the question that this asks you this morning is, do you have this kind of faith? You've seen this fulfillment of God's promises in Jesus Christ. Have you trusted Him? They trusted without even seeing Him. They trusted to the promises. You have the eyewitness testimony. You have the Holy Spirit. Are you trusting Jesus Christ? Have you turned from your sins? I mean, that's the evidence that you really do believe. You know how much Jesus hates your sin. You know that He died to take away sin. You know He gave you His Holy Spirit to write His law in your heart so that you would love what is right and you would hate sin. So have you turned from your sins? That's the evidence that you're truly born again of God and that you have saving faith. Now, the faith that all of these men and women had made them turn their back on the world and seek to enter His kingdom no matter what the price was that they had to pay because it was precious to them. Do you have this kind of faith? Is the kingdom of heaven precious to you? Is it so precious that that's what you're seeking after rather than the things of the world which are absolutely worthless? Are you willing to pay whatever price you have to pay in order to enter this kingdom? Are you seeking the city that God has prepared for those who will, even as Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses and the prophets did. Are you willing to face your enemies and not back down, whether it means God's going to give you victory in the particular cause you're championing or whether He's actually going to make you suffer because sometimes He does? Are you following the examples of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, or Daniel who, in order to serve the Lord, was hated and thrown into the lion's den? or Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were thrown into the fiery furnace. Are you willing to face these things because you believe what God said? You believe there is a better re a resurrection. You believe that He rewards those who actually will not compromise and who will follow Him no matter what price they have to pay. Do you have, in other words, the kind of faith that pleases God? Is God pleased with what He sees in you? Well, this is the only way you can please Him. It doesn't please God if you just believe but don't act. It doesn't please God if you say you trust in Jesus Christ but don't repent of your sins. This is what pleases Him, that you believe Him, that you trust His Son, and that you follow Him, and that you're willing to do that no matter what the price because you have placed a greater value on God, on Jesus Christ, and the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you don't have this kind of faith, you really do need to pray that God would give it to you because we believe this is something that only God can give. If you have it, be thankful and treasure it and give God all the glory for it because He's the one who has done it. But if you don't have it, you need to look to Him. You need to pray to Him. You need to pray that He would open your eyes and show you that what He says is true. And that He would also at the same time reveal that what He promises in His Word is far more precious, far more valuable than anything this world has to offer. So that seeing it, it will draw your heart out to it from this world to heaven. May the Lord grant to each of us that we would have this kind of faith because again, let me remind you, if you don't have it, you will perish but if you have it, you will be saved. That's what God's Word says. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's
pray that God would help us, again, to search our hearts, not to forget what it is He's told us, but live as these examples call us to live, live as our Lord Jesus Christ lived, live as He commands us to live in faith and repentance. Let's, let's bow and, and pray.